here we are. So we're both recording and we're good to go. Thank you so, so much for having me with you today. It's a great pleasure. I'm very it grateful. Is I, it is I who should thank you. And I would like to start with something maybe a bit controversial, you tell me. But those personality disorders, so the theme of today is going to be sexuality and narcissism. Although uh, this controversy or what you propose uh, along with other experts is to maybe give up on those uh, labels and uh, understanding those behavior, toxic behavior under the umbrella of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And that lead to different pattern of behavior from narcissistic behavior to borderline to codependent. But you, from what I understood and correct me if I'm wrong, it would be more uh, valuable uh, to uh, start putting all those personality and uh, the complex post-traumatic um, or complex trauma umbrella. So what, what are your take on this? How this could help us? Well, there is no, there's no meaningful debate in the profession that um, regardless of the possibility that these disorders are determined genetically, that there is some hereditary element involved. For example, we know for sure that there is a very strong hereditary element in borderline personality disorder and in antisocial personality disorder, also known as psychopathy. But regardless of this, there is no debate that what triggers the genes, if they exist, what triggers the genes, what triggers gene expression, is abuse and trauma in early childhood. Now, abuse has many forms, and many of these forms are not known as abuse. <laughs> So, for example, if you spoil the child, if you pamper the child, if you pedestalize the child, if you idolize the child, if you're overprotective, if you isolate the child, don't allow the child to interface or to have any interaction with reality and with peers, if you parentify the child, if you allow the child to treat you as the child when you are the parent, if you treat your child as your spouse, instrumentalize the child, ambient incest, all these emotional incest, all these are forms of abuse. It doesn't have to be physical or verbal or psychological or uh, sexual. It doesn't have to be visible and ostentatious. Abuse is any situation where you don't allow the child to develop boundaries and separate from you as the mother or the father, especially the mother. If you don't let the child become his or her own person and individual, if you are too insecure as a parent to let the child go and even push the child away, then you're abusing the child. So there's abuse in the background of the overwhelming vast majority of people with cluster B personality disorders and other personality disorders actually, such as paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and so on. So it is safe to say that the majority of what we call today personality disorders are actually post-traumatic conditions. They are reactions to trauma. And because the trauma has been extended and regular and all-pervasive in childhood, the trauma hasn't been a single case or a single day, but it took many years or many decades and so on and so forth, the outcome is all pervasive. The outcome is very strong and very big. And so we mistake it for the personality because we, we tend to think that everything that is permanent, everything that is ubiquitous is actually the personality, but it's not. Trauma can be permanent and ubiquitous. And I think, I think this is I think it's very wise to begin to consider what we call today personality disorders as post-traumatic conditions. Now, complex trauma can occur in childhood, in which case you develop a personality disorder in some of the cases, not in all of them. Or complex trauma can happen to you when you're an adult. For example, if you get married to the wrong guy, 
So then you're exposed to complex trauma. In this case, you're not likely to develop a personality disorder. You're very unlikely, actually. But you're very likely to demonstrate or to exhibit traits and behaviors which are often associated with personality disorders. You're likely, for example, to become highly narcissistic and a bit psychopathic and a lot borderline. <laughs> so even though you could not be diagnosed with these conditions, you are subclinical. In other words, for a while, for a limited period of time, luckily, you resemble, you emulate, you imitate someone with a personality disorder, which is an excellent proof, by the way, that personality disorders are reactions to complex trauma. So this is the picture. Another element, with your permission, another element is a mistake we make in psychology and especially in psychotherapy. When we treat these people, especially narcissists and borderlines and so on, we treat them as adults. They're not adults. They're children. These are people who failed to create an integrated, unitary, constellated self. They have what we call an identity diffusion or an identity disturbance. They don't have a core. Instead of the core, they have what we call emptiness, empty schizoid core. And so what they do, because they're empty inside, they seek people, they, they're looking for people to fulfill them. So they fulfill themselves through other people. We call this external regulation. The borderline, and for example. Borderline, narcissists yeah. narcissists are not the only one who use this strategy. No. So if we can try to expand this conversation around the other type of um, personality disorders, uh, if we can put them all in the same group, let's say, instead of uh, turning them against each other with the most evil of them, um, what, what connect them? So that's this ex external regulation, you mentioned it, they are all, all of them have this in common. If you can uh, mention the the groups we are we are talking about, are we talking about the codependent, borderlines, and narcissists? Not or, only. Or... No. We we are also talking about, for example, schizoid personality yes, disorder, schizoid. paranoid personality disorder. I tend to think that all personality disorders actually. <laughs> And there is something very sad. Uh, you mentioned. I, I I feel like you have a very pessimistic view on the on the healing of this type of behaviors because, from what I understood, you mentioned that, that with a schizoid core, there is nothing much we can do, and those people will struggle. So I'm I'm here to try to find some hope. Uh, and and develop strategies, navigate those struggles we have through life because, I mean, a lot of us can relate to those issues. So how can we live in this society with childhood trauma, uh, trying to grow up, be adult? How can we do that? Is that it? Is that is it too late? Is the society going down the drain? Or is there some hope, Sam? Before I answer this, there are other things that, that are common denominators of many personality disorders. For example, the need for fantasy. The inability to tell the difference between internal and external. And so on and so forth. But we're not going to it right now. I'll answer your question. Depends how you define um, a favorable outcome in therapy. If your aim is to stop being you and becoming someone else, then you're going to fail. If you say, for example, I have borderline personality disorder and I'm going to therapy because I want to become a different person. I want to become a person without borderline personality disorder. You're going to fail. But if your goals are much more realistic and much less grandiose and much less self-rejecting and self-hating, if your goal is simply to function well in society, then these goals are achievable and are attainable. For example, the prognosis for people with borderline personality disorder is excellent. 
81% of people with borderline personality disorder lose the diagnosis after age 45 without therapy. Half of all people with borderline personality disorder lose the diagnosis, or cannot be diagnosed anymore with BPD when they attend dialectic behavioral therapy, DBT. So the prognosis is very good. Even narcissists, we can teach them to behave in ways which are less, less abrasive, less antisocial, less aggressive, and less counterproductive and self-destructive. We can teach narcissists to do that. We can modify the narcissist's behavior. If your aim is to change the missing core or to replace the missing core with some core, that's too late. It's too late. Be and that's why we have the phrase formative years. Formative years means you were formed. You became who you are, and that's lifelong. Anyone who tells you otherwise, and there are many who tell you otherwise, they are charlatans, porn artists, or simply greedy people who want to make money on your on your malignant hope, pathological hope. You, you mentioned therapy and some uh, specific type of therapy, but you also mentioned um, self-actualization, self-development, changing the narrative, uh, shifting the point of view from victimhood to uh, uh, taking responsibility. So what kind of tools people by themselves can use to, to lessen those symptoms or the impact they have in their lives and their uh, decisions? Well, very little if you have a personality. But if you are a healthy person or if you have been impacted by complex trauma much later in life, then there are a few tools that you can use by yourself. Still, I recommend therapy. There are a few tools. For example, finding, finding your authentic voice, isolating the voices which are not yours, voices that belong to other people, implanted in your mind, and then getting rid of these voices and remaining with the only single voice that represents you. That's a critical thing. The authentic, the authentic self. For example learning to regulate your impulses and modify your expectations. This is also critical. There are many things you can you can do to, to help yourself. Um, getting rid of a victim identity, defining yourself via your victimhood, making sense of the world via your victimhood, and claiming rights that are the outcome of your victimhood. All these are very bad things. They're pathological and you, you should get rid of them. Finally, you should try to separate yourself. In, in, when you interact with mentally ill people, that not only people with personality disorders, for example, people with bipolar disorder, when you interact with mentally ill people, you tend to merge with them. You tend to fuse with them. You tend to become one with them. There's a process of enmeshment with mentally ill people for a variety of reasons. For example, maybe your maternal instinct is triggered and you want to, to protect this kind of person. You become protective. Maybe you feel that you are a savior or a healer or a fixer. You can fix this, this guy with your love. You know, It triggers many, many very primitive defenses and, and behaviors and dynamics. So there's enmeshment, there's merger infusion. And one of the main things you can do to help yourself is individuation. You need to separate yourself. You need to break apart this very sick bond and to become you. Now, I have on, on my YouTube channel, I have a playlist and it's called Narcissistic Abuse Healing. And I have another playlist titled Life's Wisdom, grandiosely titled Life's Wisdom. And there you can find many, many techniques and hints and tips and advice and so on and so forth. So just watch these and try to implement yeah. them. It's a, it's a rabbit hole, though. <laughs> I it's have difficult. the luxury but you can to start with a simple thing. To... But you can yeah. start with a simple thing. You can start with journaling. Yes. 
simply <laughs> simply talk to yourself and talk to yourself in writing so that you can revisit these pages later and see your own progress or maybe not progress maybe regression monitor supervisors that provide some kind of feedback and and allow you to calibrate yourself journaling journaling is very simple buy a notebook and a pen and start writing every day yeah it's not valued um enough now we tend to post uh, or rant and rant on social media to find validation external validation always uh, more and more so there is also okay by ourselves we can try and work on ourselves but the pressure of the society is 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 strong especially we cannot win with social media and the cult of perfection um and need to to be special so how do we counter uh, those uh, those external forces as well who are uh, limiting us well, a group of Frenchmen, actually, um, were the prophets of this period. You have Guy Debord with the Society of the Spectacle. You have Michel Foucault. You have Althusser, Louis Althusser. These were all Frenchmen, some of them neo-Marxists, some of them not. And they predicted this age, the age of spectacle, the age of ostentation, the age of pretension, the age of fakery, and the age of atomization. You have people like Emil Durkheim and so on. None, none of this is new. It's all been predicted 50 to 100 years ago. We live, in an age, we live in an age that all of us regulate externally via social media. We allow social media to affect our moods, our emotions, and our thinking. That is external regulation. In this sense, we have all become a little borderline. A little borderline and a lot narcissistic. Society, technology more precisely, has been invented by mentally ill people. It's important to understand. Social media has been invented by people who are easily diagnosable as schizoids and narcissists and psychopaths. Easily, without any, any hesitation. Technology is their extension. It's the way they saw the world. And they imposed it on us. And so we are in their world now. We are not in our world. We are in their world. We are guests. We are guests in the space of mental illness that had become modern, modern civilization. And no, it's not only Western. You can see it in India. You can see it in China. You can see it in Africa. It's, it's global. It's not only America or UK or France. It's all over. So we chose mental illness. We chose mental illness because reality has become intolerable and unbearable. If there is one common denominator to all forms of mental illness, without a single exception, it's fantasy. Mental illness is an escape, simply an escape. That's why people like Foucault and like Zas, Thomas Zas and others, dispute the very existence of mental illness. They say there's no such thing. It's a social construct. And I'm largely in agreement with them. It is a social contract. It's simply escapism. It's a way to avoid reality. Reality has become too much. No one, I don't think, if we were to confront reality, really, with no firewalls, with no deceptions, with no distortions, with no fantasies, we would really go mad. But I mean, this time, really, irre irrevocably. Ironically, oh. ironically, mental illness is the only thing keep, keeping us sane. Our sanity depends on modicum, a level of mental illness. You cannot be today sane and functional unless you are partly mentally ill. Okay, but this mental illness could be channeled or transmuted towards helping the, the greater good like creativity for example i think one of the biggest attack on humankind was the crushing creativity in the school system sexuality and the mobility those three are constantly being attacked 
um, by the system and by ourselves as well. Um, someone you mention often, and uh, I also admire very much, is Vic Viktor Frankl. Uh, this unbearable, um, he said, the quote is, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. So that's what I believe we need to use that this this insanity that we all have been affected by could be channeled. And it is sometimes with great artwork or, or movies or literature or music. So it is possible there is this uh, beauty in our insanity. So how can we leverage it to make this world a better place? Is that a very naive question? <laughs> well, all questions are naive because they assume that they are answered. It's a naive yeah. assumption. But um, Hans Eisenk suggested there is a connection between creativity and psychoticism. And psychoticism is not psychosis, not the same, but it is a mental, mental health pathology. So in effect, what he said is that creativity is a reflection of some underlying mild attenuated mental health pathology. In the overwhelming vast majority of human history, mental illness was considered to be a gift, an asset. All the founders of the great religions were met severely mentally ill. All the biblical prophets were clearly mentally ill. So mental illness until the Enlightenment, until the late 17th century, was considered to be a, a gift, an endowment by God, a divine. God touched you, and then you become, became mentally ill. And that established a channel of communication with God. God was the organizing principle, equivalent of today's science. Yeah? So, and only in the last 300 years or 400 years, we came to regard mental illness as an aberration and something bad that needs to be eradicated and exterminated and, and so on. And the reason is capitalism, of course. Capitalism requires conformity. Any deviation and divergence are a threat to capitalism. Think about a production line or a factory. I mean, if you deviate, if, if we have idiosyncrasy in a factory or in a school, it destroys the production. It destroys the ability to, to produce. Like Benjamin said, you know, Walter Benjamin, the age of replication. Uh, so in order to replicate, you need, you need identical units, indistinguishable units. You, you need to commodify and commoditize people. Yes, we are and becoming so, robots. We are yes, becoming yes. robots. Robots. Robots, by the way, is not a, a, as you know, is not a modern word. It's, I mean, it's like a hundred years old. It's, it's a, a Chapex, Chapex plane, you know, robots. So, yeah, we need to become robots and our programming needs to be identical in order to maximize outcomes, optimize production and allow for consumption. So this is absolutely an artifact of capitalism. The belief that mental illness is a bad thing. Mental illness is a deviation, another way to look at the world, another way to process information. It's not as efficacious as science if you measure everything in a materialistic way. So does I mean, science has much better outcomes than psychosis, for example. But it's simply an alternative. It's not something bad, it's something different. And it is difference that has become the enemy of modern society because modern society is focused around standardization if we so we mentioned creativity uh now if we move to the topic of sexuality as a healing modality to recreate bonds between mm -hmm. each other to uh, develop intimacy that's something that is uh um less and less possible. I mean, I had a very strange proposal last week by someone I barely know, a man who want a baby. 
And he said, you seem like you have a good genes. So I don't want a relationship with you. I just want you to make a baby and give it to me. <laughs> so this, this is the, I mean, um, so wh where are we heading? People don't want any connections or relationship. They just want a product that the legacy and uh, being completely disconnected is, 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 is that something we can do to go back to the natural way of connecting with each other through sexuality, perhaps? Consumption and, and uh, growth are the, two ideo the twin ideologies of capitalism. Eternal growth, economic growth, eternal economic growth, and consumption is an organizing principle of modern societies. But you cannot consume everything without consuming other people as well. They become consumables. Consumption is, is a way to look at the world. It's not an act. It's a way to organize the world it's a hermeneutic principle. It makes sense of the world. It, it imbues the world with meaning. When you buy a new iPhone, suddenly your life is meaningful. So you can't say, okay, I'm going to relate to 99% of the universe via consumption, but I'm going to relate to other people via empathy. You can't make this division. There's no bicameral mind. That's a myth. If you get used to consume, you're going to consume everything and everyone around you. So we have we, we have become goods. We have become material goods, not spiritual goods, material goods. We have become consumables. You consume your iPhone, you consume television program, and you consume your lover in between, if, if she's lucky. <laughs> so we have begun to objectify each other. We regard each other as consumable objects in the really bad sense of the word. Because when you objectify, you reduce. It's a reductionist approach. We have this in science where we, re we reduce things all the time. And the big, the big uh, holy grail of science is the theory of everything. And the theory of everything would have a single statement, single equation. A reduction of the whole beauty and richness of the universe into a single equation. And they think it's sane. Scientists think it's the same thing. They don't understand how insanely, how totally crazy this is. It's the same with other people. When you objectify, when you use reductionism, not holism, then you need to eliminate many dimensions. You need to reduce people into a single equation. And because the is most easily accessible equation is sex, because it's the easiest, yes? Take off your clothes or, or even not, and you have sex. It's the path of least resistance. So when we are forced to reduce other people in order to consume them, we reduce them to sex because that's the immediately available thing. If I want to reduce you to your intellect, that would take many, many probably months and years to to really interact with your intellect. It's a lot of work. But to have sex with you, this we can do in the next few minutes. It's easy. It's a question of time as well, like instant it, gratification. It's time, scarce, scarce resources, and, and so on and so forth. So people begin to confuse sexuality with sex. They're not the same. Sexuality is a mode of communication. It's a system of bonding. It's a principle of organization. It makes sense and imbues life with sense and meaning. It creates long-term commitments. It's a project. It's, it's super complex, sexuality. That's why we call it psychosexuality, not sexuality. But and there is sex. Sex is a reflex, arousal. In the mind of the men, by the way, in the mind of males, there's no difference between pornography and actual sex. That's one of the recent discoveries 10 years ago. The male brain cannot distinguish visuals from 
three-dimensional objects. So pornography is totally the same like having real sex. What about the sensory experience? Yeah, totally, the, the, the brain the brain recreates everything on the fly. It's like artificial, inter, uh, sorry, artificial uh, reality, augmented reality, and that's it. That's why men are addicted to pornography, and women not so much. Some women are, but vast majority of users are men, because as far as they are concerned, they're having sex. Now we we today we confuse the words sexual with sexy. Sexy is consumption. You are sexy. You make my mouth water. You arouse me. It's a reflex or an instinct. And I want to consume you. That's because you are sexy. Sexual is a lot more complex. To be sexual involves fantasy and imagination and intellect and, of course, looks and smell, and so many dimensions. It is so multi-layered. To be sexual involves archaeology. To be sexy involves two-dimensional cutouts or animated figures, animated dildo and sex doll. And today, when you talk to people, they don't make the difference between sexual and sexy. And that's the core problem, of course. <laughs> they perceive each other as sex sexy but not a sexual. And yet, if we move to something a bit um, darker, like sexual abuse, this is devastating and at a much higher level. So how can people recover from, from this, from being degraded, used um, at the very essence of their being? What can we say uh, to victim of sexual abuse how to move on if that is ever possible? I am not of the opinion that the reactions to sexual abuse are unique. I know this is the bon ton. I know this is third wave feminism and so on. But I don't think it's true. I think all forms of egregious abuse, all forms that of abuse that involve both body and mind, all forms of abuse that involve a power asymmetry, where one side is much more powerful than the other, all forms of such abuse engender exactly the same depth and profundity and, and intensity of reaction. So, for example, if you see a parents abusing their child, not sexually, abusing the child. The implications lifelong are catastrophic. And there's no sex involved at all. No sexual abuse. And if you see someone who has been stalked and harassed, har harassed at work by her boss, but there's no sex involved. Only years of insults and criticism and humiliation. and She would develop PTSD. She would develop post-traumatic stress disorder. The thing with sexual abuse is that it telegraphs. It's like a zip file. It compresses everything. Whereas in other forms of abuse, you need to continue for a very long time in order to accomplish the same outcomes. In sexual abuse, you could have a single incident. And with this single incident, there is a power asymmetry. There is breach of boundaries. There is invasion of the body. There's bodily harm sometimes, not always. There is humiliation. There is disrespect. There is, so it is like a, a compressed file of other forms of abuse. Compressed in time, compressed in space, compressed in meaning. I think sexual abuse is a crisis of meaning. Not so much a bodily thing, not even a, not even a psychological thing. It's a crisis of meaning. Suddenly you cannot make sense of the world. The world becomes senseless, meaningless, cr uh, crazy, dystopian, and, and you feel trapped in some kind of nightmarish scenario that you cannot extricate yourself from. And this nightmarish scenario is immediately introjected, immediately internalized, 
So when the sexual abuse or rape is far over, you're still carrying it with you for many years to come. So this is the, the potency of, of sexual abuse. But the same techniques that I use to treat trauma are very efficacious with sexual abuse. Regrettably, the fields are segregated. So when we treat sexual abuse, very few people, clinicians who treat sexual abuse use trauma therapies. And very few traumatologues, very few people who are experts in trauma therapies actually treat people with sexual abuse. So there is a segregation. Same way there's a segregation in the treatment of personality disorders and child psychology. These are two fields. Child psychologists never treat personality disorders and personality disorder clinicians never use methods from child psychology. It's a big shame. But if we were to treat victims of sexual abuse with trauma related therapies, especially mind body therapies, um, the outcome should be excellent because it's the same. When you, when you are the victim of a natural disaster, what, what happens? Or when you are at war, a, a soldier, or when you, we are wit we, you suddenly witness a horrible accident, people decapitated them. What is it that traumatizes you? Nothing happened to you. What is it that traumatizes you? The fact that you can no longer make sense of the world. The world becomes unpredictable dangerous you feel that you nothing you have known before makes any sense anymore and can guide you anymore all your scripts are broken you are not only helpless and hopeless but you are you have no meaning it's like there's no one and, and nothing that can safeguard you it's a breakdown in a sense of personal safety but in a very profound sense like if this can happen, it can happen again. And because this has happened in a way which makes no sense and had no antecedents and is totally serendipitous, it can happen again. The randomness of it. I think even in sexual abuse, it's the randomness. Majority of, uh, majority of rapes and sexual abuse cases involve acquaintances. Acquaintances, spouses, good friends, Majority, depending on the depending on the class of sexual abuse, between seventy and ninety percent. So suddenly you can't trust a friend anymore, you can't trust your spouse anymore, you can't trust your lover anymore, you can't trust your neighbor anymore. You can't trust. It is a breakdown of trust, and this is the core issue, I think, not the fact that a penis penetrated a vagina. Okay, it's not okay. And it's violent, and it's this, and it's that, there's power asymmetry. Okay, I understand all that. And of course, it's very unpleasant and horrible and everything. But I don't think that's the reason for the trauma. I think the trauma is because after it's all over, you're lost. All your guidelines are gone. Can we move on? Thank you for that, To You mentioned feminism, third grade feminism. Third wave, uh, the, not third wave. Third wave, <laughs> thank you. Um, the, the, yes, your view on the new feminism and also the rise of, of psychopathy among women, this war between gender, can, can you touch upon that a bit, please? I like your phrase, third grade feminism, because third grade means torture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Given the third degree, it's torture. I realize that. Um, <laughs> There's what is a, happening? Yes. Sorry, what, yeah, what is happening in our society between men and women? Well, there's been there's been a schism, there's been a break off between first and second wave feminism and third and fourth wave feminism. And this break created a crisis in classical gender roles, masculinity and femininity. And of course, we should distinguish gender, which is a performative social construct, from sex, which is biologically determined. Even non-binary sex, even indeterminate sex, 
is biologically determined. Even homosexuality is biologically determined. Sex is biological, end of story. That it could be very varied, that we could have dozens of types of sexuali sex sexuality, it's okay, because biology is varied. <laughs> biology is a great inventor, a great creator. And we were blind, simply, to other alternatives, male, female. There are other alternatives, of course. There have always been other alternatives. <laughs> We were just blind to them for social reasons. But we should distinguish sex from gender. Gender is socially determined and it's performative. Gender is about signaling. It's a form of signaling. And it includes, prof uh, it includes massive elements of virtual signaling and, and relative positioning within society. Cre the creation on the fly of hierarchies power plays, and mind games from time to time. So gender is a way that society organizes itself in order to maximize production of some things, for example, production of children. So what happened is gender roles broke down. And by the way, they broke down long before feminism. Feminism started 150 years ago. The suffragettes. It was 150 years ago. Not so long ago. However, gender broke down 150 to 200 years before that. If you read novels by Oprah Benn, and even to some extent Jane Austen, you begin to see the breakdown of gender roles. And the reason gender roles broke down is that men have become scarce. There were fewer and fewer men because they were killing themselves in wars, mainly. <laughs> men have become scarce. Well over 20 million men died in the First World War and something like 30 million men died in the Second World War and this was within 30 years on a single continent. The fact is, there were no men. And not only did they become scarce, but they became inanely and dangerously self-destructive. Whereas main men were engaged in a project of construction and productivity until the beginning of the 19th century, starting in the 19th century, men engaged in destruction. The main project of masculinity was destruction, to destroy each other, other nations, other collectives, other groups to invent new weapons, ever, ever, ever more powerful weapons and potent weapons. It was all focused on destruction. And indeed, the so biggest. Can, indeed can the we biggest connect? Is the, yeah. so, sorry for cutting you, but can we co connect the, the, this destruction, drive for destruction to the rise of narcissism? Is that the same? I think. It's probably the other way around. When you feel threatened, you become narcissistic. Okay. So I think this drive to destruction gave rise to narcissism, not the other way around. But women gave up on men. As simple as that. They just gave up on men. And they began to wish to become self-sufficient and independent rather than dependent. And it became an agenda, and then it became a political agenda. And there was nothing wrong with it. I think women were doing the right thing. Men were out of their minds, and they still are. Women are right to disengage before they are dragged into the abyss with men. They were right to do that. And now, nowadays, women are more educated than men. That's a fact. Under age 25, women make more money than men. 42% of women are lifelong single, so they don't need men. A sizable proportion of women conceive without a man, IVF technologies and so on, about 10% of women conceive without a man. Um, an even much more sizable proportion don't want children at all, remain childless. There's been a divorce. We divorce. Women divorce men. Men's reaction was twofold. Initially, men reacted as men do testosterone. They became aggressive. Aggressive, oppressive, it didn't work. It didn't work because men were no longer equipped to cope with life and to be productive. They lost this. 
and so only women remain in the game. When men realized this, when they realized that aggression would lead them nowhere, and that they were losing the hegemony, the control, the mastery that they used to have in the last 5,000 years at least, when they realized this, they, tr they transitioned from aggression to submission. And today what men are doing, they're trying to become women, not women, but tr they're trying to become more feminized men, while women have chosen to become men. There are studies by Lisa Wade and many others that show that women today identify as men used to in the 1950s. They use the same adjectives, ambitious, driven, ruthless, callous, and so on, when they describe themselves. So women today are men. Women today are the men of the 1950s. Same. And men are lost. Aggression failed. Submission drives women away. Because who wants to be with submissive people? And so the, the end result is what I call the unigender. There's a single gender. There are men with vaginas and men with penises. The single gender, and it's increasingly more women-defined, fem female-defined. Nothing wrong with that. There have been periods in history where women were in control, or at least geographical locations where women were in control. There's no reason to assume that women will do much worse than men in managing the affairs of humanity. So nothing's wrong with that, but men are lost. They're angry. They are, and so this divorce is looking more and more permanent rather than, and I think there's a gender war and the emergence of unigender is not helping because now both parties are competing on exactly the same playing field. In the past, women were in charge of home and men was in charge of work. So they didn't have, they didn't compete for territory. <laughs> the demarcation was clear, but now they're on the same field. It's the same territory and men are losing. Absolutely. I mean, anyone who doesn't see this is, is not with us. Men are absolutely losing. And of course, there's convulsions, you know, the cancellation of Roe versus Wade in the United States and women suppressed in Afghanistan. They're, in Russia, domestic abuse has been decriminalized. Yes, there are men are fighting back. There's a backlash. That's the war. But women are going to win this war because men have succumbed. Men have accepted the unigender as a tolerable or acceptable solution, especially the younger generation let's say, millennials, Gen Z, and alphas, they accept the unigender as a tolerable solution. They no longer would define themselves as men and women. They would find, I work with the, with, these, with the young people, they find it a bit antiquated, a bit old fashioned. They, they don't define them, they define themselves as person. I'm a person. So what kind of person I am? Male and female are no longer identity determinants. Where will this all end? I don't know. You see, there is this myth that we the planet is overpopulated. It is overpopulated by old people like me. We miss, we need 300 to 500 million children. Because if we don't have these children, the pension schemes will collapse. There will be social unrest. We are bloody mess. And there will be no one to take care of old people like me when I need it. We are we have a deficit of about 300 million children, maybe 500 million, there's a debate. And the charm, the magnetism between the genders, gender roles, they had they have they had positive aspects. They were abused by men. Gender roles were abused by men, but they had their positive aspects. I mentioned charm and magnetism and attraction and the beautiful intricate intricate game, so subtle and so enigmatic and the discovery of each other as a woman and a man. There was beauty in it. We have taken away the narrative. We are no longer living in a story. We are living in 
solipsistic atomized fantasies, which involve Netflix, of course, and a cat in the majority of cases. Even men are beginning to adopt cats, which is a very worrying sign. Yes, I, I feel lucky. I am old school as well. Um... I was born in the 80s and yes, it was a bit caricatural, stereotype, like girls like Barbies and and boys play with GI Joes, but it was so simple at the same time. Um, yeah. And it generated sexual attraction. We cannot deny this. The differences, the differences generated attraction. It's very difficult to be attracted to someone who essentially is you. Same, yeah. Is you well, unless you're narcissistic, which would explain narcissism, the rise of narcissism. Aha. Uh -huh. You develop a tiny bit before we, we finish on, on, on that. So the unigender uh phenomena could explain as well the rise of narcissism. Yes, because the species must must continue to exist. Evolution and nature don't care about our social plays and social contracts. And if the situation is that we are all of the same gender, then narcissism is a great way to be attracted to other people because we are essentially being attracted to ourselves, which would explain the rise in homosexuality, the substantial rise. It's not only coming out of coming out. It's not only coming out. It's a real rise in homosexuality, especially among women, by the way. And that's because we are more and more attracted to ourselves. And we are attracted to ourselves either directly. Masturbation is the number one sexual activity, by the way. Yes, you mentioned auto-erotization. Auto-erotism. Um, auto-erotism. Okay. So we're either attracted to ourselves or we're attracted to someone who is so reminiscent of ourselves that we could easily get confused and say, it's my reflection. Narcissism, is, I think, is the species' way of trying to perpetuate, to perpetrate to perpetuate the species it's it's the it's evolution solution to allow us to continue to have sex and continue to have children somehow because if we were not auto erotic if we were not attracted to ourselves all sex would have ceased already because the differences between men and women are increasingly more difficult to tell females and males sorry differences between females and males are increasingly more difficult to tell and the differences are being erased, intentionally erased. It's a policy. And so what's left? How would I be attracted to someone like me if I'm not a narcissist, if I'm not autoerotic? I think it's a great solution for survival of the species. Okay. But it's not really working if we have a deficiency. I'm you're, being, in, you're being cut off. Baby you natality. Repeat? Could you repeat your work at all? So, thank you. Um, you said narcissism might be a solution to reproduce the species, but at the same time, there is a paradox because there is not enough babies. We don't make any any babies anymore. So, how do we uh, reconcile the two? Auto erotism is a problematic solution because, in the majority of cases, you would prefer yourself as a sexual object, which explains masturbation and the rise in sex toys and sex dolls and you know uh but that's the only possible solution when you erase all gender differences and when you allow people to transition from one sex to another when there's sex fluidity it's the only solution otherwise there would be zero attraction at least like that 20 30 percent would end up having sex and children but if you didn't have this, if you didn't have homoerotism, then this too would be lost. Or homoerotism is a stress reaction. For example, it's very, very common in prisons, in military barracks, where people are under enormous stress, enormous anxiety, and so on and so forth, they become autoerotic. When you have sex in prison with another prisoner, who is a man who looks like you, who is then you're having sex with yourself. You're masturbating with someone else's body. So it's a stress reaction, absolutely. It's an anxiety reaction. Today, sex is an anxiety reaction. You ask people, we ask people in studies how they experience sex, they experience it as 
not a very pleasant thing. The, it's full of performance anxieties and fears of sexual assault. There is a, an orgasm gap where the overwhelming vast majority of women do not orgasm and the overwhelming vast majority of men don't know how to orgasm them, are totally undrilled in sex. There is a collapse in sexual scripts, in social scripts. So even sex has become an, an anxiety-inducing activity rather than anxiolytic. Yes, and we, it's and supposed we, to be. It's Some, supposed to be it's anxiolytic. Supposed to be. And the most beautiful way to connect and bond with each other and build intimacy. So yeah. how how it has been so degraded and hijacked um, and commercialized? Well, I think we 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 touched on all the all the reasons and yeah. all the points, but the end result is yeah. indeed this: that today when you go on a date, you are not happy, you are not relaxed, you are you, it's not a release. It's not something to look forward to. You're bloody anxious. You're worried. You're worried for a variety of reasons, narcissistic reasons. Do I look good? Do I, am I impressive? It's impression management. It's a display. It's performative. It's a performance. But you're also worried because the other party may be crazy. Maybe crazy. The other party may be abusive. The other party may be aggressive. Actually, the chances are pretty high. <laughs> So the whole process of dating and has become a minefield. And the consequence, according to Pew Center, is that about half of all adults have no contact, sexual contact, with anyone in the year in the preceding year. Uh, sorry, they have they are lifelong singles. Let's put it this way. They're lifelong singles. Half of all adults didn't have sex in the preceding year, but they are lifelong singles. They are committed to singlehood, uh, being alone is perceived to be a very rational choice nowadays because the cost of human interaction has become utterly unacceptable and disproportionate. The benefits versus the cost, the cost is disproportionate. And so everyone, you know, and that's why technology allows you to become more self-sufficient. Technology caters to your needs. What is your need? To be self-sufficient, to be independent, to minimize interactions with other people to limit them, to channel them, maybe to avoid them altogether. So technology comes to the rescue. And there you are. And we all live in tiny cubicles, in warehouses known as buildings, tiny cubicles. And we consume Netflix and we play with our cats. And this is where it seems things are going. There is a big debate nowadays in evolutionary, bio, um, evolutionary sociology, there's a big debate whether Aristotle was wrong. And we are not zone political. We are not a social animal. Maybe we are an asocial animal, antisocial even animal. Maybe the period okay. where, we were, where we socialized, we were forced to socialize in the virtual reality known as cities. Maybe that period was an aberration because the overwhelming majority, because the rest of, of history, we were in caves. We lived in caves or small smaller dwellings. Group. Small Very groups. Very tiny yeah. groups, yeah. So Hobbes was right when he said man is a wolf for man. It's, it's possible that we have, that we mistook, we misunderstood the nature of, of, of men. Men as a, you know, mankind. Yeah. It's possible that we actually are solitary animals that were forced to collaborate, were forced to work together or act together because we were we were confined in virtual spaces known as cities. There was the famous experiment with rats when they confined them and you know the famous experiment where the rats became aggressive and, and, so, Function, yeah. and so this would explain crime for example would explain crime. Crime so, is, is a pathology. Yeah. We're going round and I think that's perfect perfect conclusion for this um, di amazing discussion with you. Thank you. We started the conversation by uh, pointing out the schizoid core of those personality um, dysfunctional way of, yeah, of behaving. Okay. So it, it might not be a disorder at all. It might be our 
adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. Some scholar things think that these are positive adaptations. And there are scholars who, who glorify and glamorize psychopathy and narcissism. They say that's the next stage in evolution. I believe we cannot, I mean, if it's rising, we cannot do without, and we have to find a common, uh, a way to live together and to leverage the is many um, qualities that instead of using them to destroy and manipulate and hurt, could be channel for the greater good. That's... If, you can, if you can't beat them, join them. Exactly, exactly. That's part of my saying. If you cannot beat your enemy, turning into your friend. And, and that's why I admire you so much, because this is basically the way I see you. So you manage to channel your own narcissism to help people around. And when I describe you, I like to call you Dexter. I hope I hope you're not going to get offended. That's a serial. It was a serial killer. Uh, Siri, 10 years or 15 years old now, the serial killer that he cannot do anything about his compulsion. So he decided to hunt serial killers. And I <laughs> see you. <laughs> I see you are the Dexter of psychology. And I, I admire so much um, your work and the way you help us all to grow and, and, be, and be better. Just better. one thing don't, don't idealize. People yeah. like me. I'm not yeah. doing this. I'm not doing this to help people. Yeah. It's a side, supply. It's a side effect. It's a side effect. Yeah. But that's not my motivation. And that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I can give you all the um, the supply you want as long as you you it can help uh, more more of us. I mean, there's no problem of being you on see, the top. You've learned you've learned to manipulate a narcissist. <laughs> next, <laughs> next benefit of this conversation. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. But yeah, we, we need to find a way to live with each other and, and make and make each other happy the best we can. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me. It was a yeah. an interesting conversation. Thank you. Very challenging. Oh well, that's a very good compliment. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Au revoir. Okay. Au revoir. <laughs>